All right, welcome back to Whence Came You, episode 100. This is our 100th episode, and all the thanks goes out to you guys, the listeners, the supporters, and the fans of the show. But of course, thanks to Freemasonry as well. I have to say thanks to my wife and kids for putting up with my late hours, and a huge thanks to all the brothers that I have met through this show. You know who you guys are. So episode 100, is it an extravaganza? Not exactly. I think it's awesome, and I thank everyone for the success thus far in the ability to write, produce, record, edit, and put this out there. But this is a bit like kindergarten graduation, right? Your education didn't stop there, and this show isn't stopping here. We're going to keep on trucking, but a milestone nonetheless. I wanted to have Brother Todd Creason on the show for our 100th episode, but he's a little busy with some things at the moment, those little curveballs life throws you every once in a while. And speaking of curveballs, I want to share with you guys a little story. I have an event that I needed to attend, and I need my dues card to attend this meeting. And let me tell you something. I have this habit of keeping my dues cards all together in a little wallet. I have like seven of them. It's ridiculous. Uh, Seven dues cards, that is, not wallets. And uh, all of a sudden, I couldn't find them. I was freaking out. My wife is looking high and low. She can't find them. I come home from work, I can't find them. Two days this went on, and then it hit me. Let me check my briefcase one more time. So I emptied it, but then I saw a little glimmer of a zipper, and I said to myself, what's that zipper open up? And so I expected to unzip it and have it maybe zip the current compartment that I was looking into closed. But lo and behold, it actually opened up, and it was a secret compartment, which apparently works very well because my dues cards were right inside there. I put them in there, I zipped it shut, and forgot all about it months ago. So let that be a lesson to all of you. Remember, you need your dues card to visit other lodges, and that means don't hide them from anyone, including yourself. Anyway, so this week, I just want to give you this. It's a lecture by Chris Hodap, and I think you will all love it. It's about 30 minutes, and it's truly awesome. I went down to Danville, Illinois, where Brother Hodap was hanging out for our festive board at the Valley of Danville for St. John Day. And if you listened last week, you no doubt heard Brother James E. Fry give a presentation on St. John's Day. After dinner and a lecture by James, we uh, went upstairs to the Red Room, and we listened to Brother Chris Hodap. So, here is that lecture by Brother Chris Hodap. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here in Danville. I've never been to Danville before, and so uh, uh, it's, uh, you have a beautiful building and uh, tremendous cooks, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm Chris Hodap. Uh, I'm the author of Freemasons for Dummies, and uh, as uh, Brittany Spears said to her first husband, don't worry, I'm not going to keep you a long time. <laughs> My uh, Masonic career began 13 years ago. I joined Broad Ripple Masonic Lodge on November, uh, November of 1998. I was passed and raised in a one-day class on the Ides of March in 1999. I was immediately jabbed with an officer's pike into a steward's chair. I became senior warden in December of 2000, elected worshipful master in December of 2001, just two years after joining. I don't recommend it. <laughs> And then two years after that, I sat as Master of Lodge Vitruvian, number 767, for two years in a row. So in my first six years, I spent 50% of my time as Master of a Lodge. In these short 13 years, I've visited lodges in almost every state, plus several foreign countries. I'm truly the luckiest guy in all of Freemasonry, and it's given me a chance to see a lot outside of the borders of my own state of Indiana. I got to write all my books because of the threat of Dan Brown. Eight years ago, Dan Brown said the sequel to The Da Vinci Code would be about Masons in Washington, D.C. Then he kept the publishing world on pins and needles waiting for it. So for six years, we got stacks of books about Freemasonry from mainstream publishers, TV shows, National Treasure, comic books, and more, all hoping to cash in on Brown's anticipated sequel, The Lost Symbol. It was released on September 15, 2009. Brown's The Lost Symbol is a 509-page love letter to the fraternity of Freemasonry. Every Mason needs to read it because it may very well be where the majority of our new members come over the next 10 years where they first learned about us. 
Up until a few years ago, most Americans had no opinion about us whatsoever. Our job wasn't just attracting new men, it was about teaching society about who we were. Because of almost three generations of men who never joined the fraternity, we fell off society's radar screen. Well, not anymore. The Lost Symbol sold a million copies on its very first day of sales. That's likely to about 990,000 who really didn't know who or what the Freemasons were who were reached on the very first day of sales. It sold two million in its first week. The initial English language version print run was six and a half million copies with five million in the U.S. alone, followed by another four million paperbacks. When it was released in paperback in England, it set a record for the most copies of a novel ever sold in a week. Not bad for a dumb novel that gives a pretty truthful explanation about Freemasonry, particularly in that country which is very culturally suspicious of Freemasonry. Now the great news is this book doesn't present Masons as a bunch of treacherous, bald-headed, cat-stroking super geniuses, but is almost reverential in its treatment of the fraternity. The very real Washington, D.C. headquarters of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction, the House of the Temple, is the setting for important sequences in the thriller. In fact, our Scottish Rite brethren in the Southern Jurisdiction get to be the stars of the show. The double-headed eagle is on the cover of the book. Even the release date of 91509 adds up to the number 33. That was intentional. Do we have any Knights Templars in the room? Well, and if you, uh, if you know anything about uh, the lost symbol, you know that Brown had to interject the coolest parts of the Knight Templar degree in order to make the Scottish Rite seem more interesting. <laughs> You've heard of a sonic boom. Well, I think we're poised for a masonic boom. Dan Brown, on the threat of his book, almost single-handedly created new interest in the fraternity. More than 70 mainstream books from publishers have come out in the last seven years, with dozens more coming. There have been TV shows, comic books, movies, magazines. My wife and I were interviewed for a History Channel show about two months ago. Those keep coming. The movie version is due to be released next year with the same team that made The Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons. Those two films combined made over a billion dollars at the box office. Nine months after that will be a DVD release. Brethren, if we know how the book goes, we know how it ends, we know where it takes place, we know everything about it. If we can't make something of this, there's something very, very wrong with us. Now some will say, who cares, it's only a novel. Well, here's why the potential influence of this book needs to interest us. In May of 2006, a Catholic group calling itself the Da Vinci Code Response Group sponsored a survey of 1,000 adults in the United Kingdom. The Da Vinci Code at that time had been read by 22% of all the adults in England. A massive 60% of the adults polled believed that there was truth to the claim that Jesus had married Mary Magdalene and had a child after reading Brown's book, compared with just 30% of those who hadn't read it. That's the power of a dumb novel. In the first three days after the law symbol was released, the Grand Lodge of Missouri received 25 phone calls looking for information on how to join a lodge. In 2009, just 67 people contacted the Colorado Freemasons through their website seeking information on joining the fraternity. In 2010, that number soared to 497. Now, it could be that Freemasonry has turned a corner. It could be the Dan Brown effect, the explosion of social media, or just an unprecedented amount of exposure in media to Masonry that has resulted in these kinds of increased contacts. Maybe the Grand Lodge of Colorado just improved its website. But whatever the reason, everywhere I go, every Grand Lodge jurisdiction I talk to shows these kinds of increases, and almost every lodge I talk to tells me initiations are up all over the country. The residual effect of this book will go on for years, from boys who first find out about Freemasonry in the book but are too young to join. But the seed is planted and comes out maybe as late as after college. At the other end of the spectrum, the baby boomers are retiring in massive waves now. They're doing a lot of beach reading, books like The Lost Symbol. They haven't been joiners historically in the past, but their dad or their grandfather may have been a Mason, and the book sets off a spark. My 60-year-old brother-in-law just joined a lodge down in Texas. I'll tell you why, well, I'll tell you why I joined a little later on, but suffice it to say it was about my father-in-law's funeral service. And my brother-in-law saw that same service and was just as affected by it. It just took him 10 years longer than it took me to join. Most of his life he was pretty unengaged by society. I mean, face it, he wanted to be a garbage collector because he thought they only worked one day a week. 
Okay, some of you thought that too. All right. All right. What did he tell me? He said, I've never joined anything in my life. My parents joined the Boy Scouts for me, but I've missed an awful lot in my life with that attitude. I want to be part of something more important than just me. Anecdotally, we're seeing more and more men in their 20s and 30s bringing in their 60 and 70 year old baby boomer fathers into their lodges. I'm telling you, brethren, this could be bigger than we imagine over a long period of time if we allow ourselves to succeed and if we're careful about how we present our image, because there is a struggle going on now around the Masonic world that's wrestling over the very definitions of what Freemasonry is. It's funny, we tend to think of English Masons as our better. We get fooled by the accents. Face it, come on, they believe in crop circles. <laughs> the Grand Secretary of England, Nigel Brown, told the press last year it would be intolerable for a Mason to tell a non-Mason that there are secrets we can't tell them. Intolerable. That cuts the very heart right out of the essence of the fraternity. Of course we have secrets that each man must find for himself. Secrecy is a symbol of our honor. There's greater interest in Freemasonry right now than there's been in the last five decades, but if prospective men are told, really, just a big happy charity here with some silly rituals and these wacky apron thingies, no big deal, how many will bother to petition? Why should they? Now some think the fraternity needs to get much smaller. I disagree. I'm not one of those guys who thinks the best experience is ten guys marching around in their socks in somebody's living room pronouncing that the rest of the Masonic world is doing it all wrong. I want us to grow and again take our proper place at the center of our communities. That won't happen if no one knows who and what we are. That's our job, yours and mine, every day. And professional men, business leaders, won't stand for amateur night at the Ritz, fiscal incompetence, or having their time wasted arguing over whether to fix the roof or raise the dues by $2 a year. As wonderful and laudable as our charities are, Freemasonry isn't about chips programs, hospitals, ambulance services, or retirement homes. Freemasons support these things, but they should never define what we are. Freemasonry isn't a charity or a church or a business, but it seems that some of our members disagree on just exactly what it is. So I tell Masons everywhere to work on their elevator pitch so they don't get caught tongue-tied when someone asks what Masonry is about. Not some canned Grand Lodge speech memorized off the back of a brochure. Tell a man why you join, why you come back to Lodge every week and give up your free time to do this. What it means, why it means what it means to you because that's the story he wants to hear. Next time you walk into your lodge, do it with the eyes and ears you had the first day you decided to become a Mason. I want you to try right now to forget everything else you've experienced in Masonry, good and bad, and fixing your mind. Why did I join? What was I seeking? What did Freemasonry offer that I wanted to be a part of? That's the starting point of where to begin to lead your own lodge to a successful future, to do all you can to make it the lodge you expected it to be. Little girl went up to her grandfather and said, Grandpa, can you make us sound like a frog? And he said, well, yes, honey, I think I can. Why do you ask? She said, well, Dad said we get to go to Disneyland when you croak. <laughs> Anybody who says this fraternity needs to change hasn't been looking around. I, I, we've all heard the joke, this fraternity won't change until we have a few more Masonic funerals. Well, I don't make that joke because they may be talking about me, so... Part of it is cultural, part is technological, and part is generational. But the Freemasonry we're living through today is definitely not our grandfather's fraternity. The executive secretary of the Masonic Service Association was on an NPR show last year. He was asked about Masonic references to popular music and music videos by Lady Gaga, Rihanna, and Jay-Z. He said he didn't know anything about Lady Gaga or Jay-Z. We better learn because for an increasing wave of new men, we no longer control what our image is. The culture does. There's a Prince Hall Lodge here in Illinois, Olive Branch number 94 in Chicago. It's got a website that was sent to me by a brother who was absolutely aghast over what he saw on the website. It had a video that showed animation of Masonic symbolism accompanied by a rap song about the lodge. Whether Olive Branch's music or their video appeals to your taste or not, every lodge has its own personality. Olive Branch knows who their target audience is and that new members come from the friends and families of their existing members. And every lodge that has an active lineup of new candidates and a regular rotation of officers coming through is going through a major evolution in programs, interests, vision, and personality right now. 
That means a lodge can be a very, very different place in as little as five years. The internet and social networking like Facebook are allowing that evolution to happen at a faster rate than ever before in the history of the fraternity. And ideas are shared all around the Masonic world instantly. Long forgotten Masonic books that haven't been available in dozens and even hundreds of years are now available on Google, Kindle, and iPad. We have greater opportunities for Masonic education than at any time in our history. I keep saying we live in exciting times. We have greater variety among lodges now than at any time in our history. While there have been clashes between traditionalists who want things to remain as they were after World War II versus exuberant young men who want to make instant changes, the fraternity seems to be finding a middle ground. There are lodges that concentrate on pitching dinners and a hot hand of poker, but there are also a growing number of lodges that are concentrating on the more esoteric aspects of Freemasonry's three centuries of ritual ceremonies, philosophy, and symbolism. While once there were lodges of hundreds or even thousands of members, new lodges are forming with just handfuls of men in search of a smaller, more intimate, and active experience. Traditional observance lodges, European concept lodges, and AMD councils are all starting with just handfuls of men. We need to back off worrying so much about putting new butts on seats and start worrying about how we keep them there. It's when lodges stop serving the needs of their active members that they fail because no one has to come back to next month's meeting. If CSI reruns are more interesting than lodge, then shame on us. If your lodge is nothing but a place you meet and flee from, it needs to fix itself or it needs to close. Lodges don't have to have 200 members to be a big success and lodges don't have to be all alike. They just have to serve their members needs for friendship, affection, education, philosophy, along with some fun and good food of course. We all weighed 110 pounds when we joined this fraternity, right? There's no age limit to good leadership. Have Xbox tournaments, chili cook-offs, or bus trips to the casino. Shake up your stated meetings. Hold them in the dining room as table lodges. Have new brothers write a paper before they advance to the next degrees. You'd be astonished at what you can learn from the observations of someone else experiencing the degrees for the first time. Bring in a history professor from the local college to talk about medieval architecture or comparative religions. Have debates on symbolism. If you can't get enough members to put on the degrees, form partnerships with other lodges and share the work. If all your members are over the age of 75 have wheelchair races in the hallway, I don't care. Your only limits are the ones you place upon yourself and your lodge. The most important lodge meeting in a Mason's entire career is the fourth one, the next meeting after his Master Mason degree. That's the meeting he'll measure the entire fraternity by, the meeting in which he sees whether his lodge lives by the precepts they taught him in his degrees. Lodges are closing every day because they don't understand why no one wants suspicious meat sandwiches and generic pop or furniture from the Coolidge administration that stinks that should be cleaned and then burned with two-hour meetings that consist of reading the minutes to tell them nothing happened last month either, followed by guys stabbing each other in the back as they argue in the parking lot. I was visiting Pennsylvania, and there was a guy in the front row. He was a past master, and he had that past master talon, that hooked finger that he wanted to <laughs> accuse me of something with. And he said, don't you think that Grand Lodge is destroying our lodges? I said, no, Grand Lodge doesn't make your lodge boring, filthy, with no education and lousy food. Grand Lodges can provide tools and advice, but only the local lodge can demand greatness of itself and not become that most terrible of things, ordinary. Every lodge has the potential to make itself the very best. More important, you never know what you and your lodge will do that will touch lives in ways you never think of. I said I'd tell you why I joined. My father-in-law was a 50-year Mason, and he lived most of his life in Indianapolis, but he decided to retire for whatever reason in Dallas, Texas. So he and his wife moved down there, and they lived there for the last 15 years of their lives. And when he passed away, my wife and I went down to arrange the funeral service. They had tons of friends in the local VFW and American Legion Hall. He wasn't active in masonry in Texas, but he was very active in the uh, American Legion and the VFW. So we figured there would be hundreds of friends that would come out for the funeral. The Sunday night before the Monday funeral, my wife said, you know, Dad was a mason, and I think they do some sort of Masonic funeral service, if I'm not mistaken. I said, well, I haven't the slightest idea. Nobody in my family was a mason. So I pulled out the Dallas phone book and started calling every Masonic Lodge I could find. And God loved Lodge secretaries. I found one working late on a Sunday night. 
And I told him the situation. He said, wow, I don't know if there's anything I can do. This is pretty short notice. Give me the information, and I'll see what I can do. So we didn't hold out a lot of hope. So the next day, we went to the funeral parlor, and nobody came. There were about, there was the members of the family, and there were four or five neighbors. All those friends from the VFW and the American Legion Hall stayed away. None of them came. But 10 Freemasons showed up, 10 Freemasons who didn't know him, who didn't pester the family to see if the dead man had a paid up dues card, who didn't call the Grand Lodge to make sure they weren't violating some sort of Lodge pro Grand Lodge protocol, who didn't call the Masonic Service Association to make sure they weren't doing something that crossed state lines that would get them in trouble. All they knew was that the family of a Mason had called on a Sunday night and wanted their help. And they put on a funeral service that was far more powerful than anything the rented minister said, who kept mispronouncing his name. And when it was all over, they stood in the back of the room and they waited until we left and they said, we know that you're from out of town and there are things that are gonna come up that you're gonna need help with. Here's our names, here's our phone numbers, here's our addresses. You contact us if there's anything that we can do to help you. And on the flight home the next day, I told my wife, that's something I gotta be a part of. Brethren, Freemasonry isn't about ritual because, face it, who would voluntarily join a memorization club? And it sure isn't about the trappings of lodge mechanics and politics because I've never yet met a Mason who joined because he wanted to be a lodge officer. It's not about the things we do or the minutia of how we do it. It's about what we are. It's about connecting one to one, brother to brother. Now my wife says I talk in my sleep and everybody knows a guest speaker is somebody who talks in everybody else's sleep, so I'll wrap this up. Masonry is not ordinary and I can tell you stories from around the world to prove it. The Grand Lodge of New York operates several lodges in Lebanon and Syria. They have to do it in secret because Freemasonry is essentially outlawed in those countries. Men are risking their very lives to put on a Masonic apron in those countries. And yet I got an email from a master of a lodge in Damascus, Syria, who wanted 10 copies of this dumb book, Freemasons for Dummies, to give to his officers. Men who are literally risking their freedom. And he wanted 10 copies of this dumb book. In England up until last year, if you were a member of the judiciary, if you were a police officer, if you were a judge, you had to declare that you were a Freemason, not a member of a stamp collecting club or even the IRA. Only Freemasons were singled out for that kind of treatment. In the Ukraine a few years ago, they almost passed a law that if it was discovered you were a Freemason and a member of the government, it would mean an 18-year jail sentence. During the Holocaust, more than 80,000 Masons were killed in the, in the Nazi death camps. Masons fight every day around the world for the privilege of putting on a Masonic apron. Brethren, the leaders of tomorrow are in this room. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking that you as an individual Mason can't influence Freemasonry, that the work of just one Mason can't make a difference, hmm, even a dummy. I'm here to tell you one Mason can. Each and every one of you has the potential to shape the Freemasonry of tomorrow. It's truly an exciting time to be a Freemason. We've been given a whole new chance that Grand Masters laid awake, awake nights dreaming of. And we have so much to offer, something legendary, something mythical, something extraordinary. The Freemasonry that has inspired millions of men the world over. The Freemasonry that inspired you to join. That same Freemasonry is about to be introduced to a massive new wave of men. With one book, Dan Brown has done more than any membership committee or Grand Lodge PR department ever could. The lost symbol has the potential to affect this fraternity more than any development in the last 60 years. Yes, Dan Brown has made us seem more mystical, maybe more interesting than your lodge really is. If you didn't have the motivation before, now's your chance to make it the very best it can be. When we have vision, when we believe this fraternity can truly build temples in the hearts of men, when we believe in the power to change society and the world around us by making better men one Mason at a time, Freemasons can and do and will accomplish great things. Freemasons have been making and shaping history for more than 300 years. I believe we're poised to make history all over again. Thank you.
All right, now, of course, I have to send out a huge thanks to Brother Chris Hodap for letting us use that lecture for the show. Uh, Brother Chris, if you're listening, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it, and I know all of our listeners really enjoyed it as well. Now, we're going to move on to our little thanks that we have to do to the affiliates that uh, help sponsor this show. On it Labs, if you're into good, healthy living, go to our website, wcypodcast.com, and click through the links for On It and take 10% off your order with the uh, coupon code WCY. Check out our Stitcher Smart Radio and register for free with the code Whence Came You, all one word with no spaces, which will get you access to the show and personalized stream of content. Check out our Apple and Android apps, which also let you listen streaming, but with the added bonus features of videos, wallpapers, and the papers we read in PDF. All for free after you purchase the app just once. Finally, if you aren't into that, no apps, uh, we do have a donation button, which is run through PayPal, and all that stuff just helps keep the lights on and the tape rolling. Of course, this isn't done on tape, but uh, you get the gist. Thanks to everyone out there who helps out. And now let's move on. I wanted to read a well-known poem by the Poet Laureate of Freemasonry. One of the founders of the Eastern Star and the ritual writer, Brother Robert Morris. This is probably his most well-known poem, and it's entitled The Level in the Square, of course, by Brother Rob Morris, Poet Laureate of Freemasonry. The poem itself was written in August of 1854, and it As I said, it is the most popular Masonic poem of all time. We meet upon the level, and we part upon the square. What words of precious meaning those words Masonic are? Come, let us contemplate them. They are worthy of a thought. In the very walls of masonry, the sentiment is wrought. We meet upon the level, though from every station come, the rich man from his palace and the poor man from his home. For the rich must leave his wealth and state outside the mason's door, and the poor man finds his best respect upon the checkered floor. We act upon the plum, tis the orders of our guide. We walk upright in virtue's way and lean to neither side. The all-seeing eye that reads our hearts doth bear us witness true, that we still try to honor God and give each man his due. We part upon the square for the world must have its due. We mingle with multitude a faithful band and true. But the influence of our gatherings and memory is green, and we long upon the level to renew the happy scene. There's a world where all are equal. We are hurrying toward it fast. We shall meet upon the level there when the gates of death are past. We shall stand before the Orient, and our master will be there. To try the blocks, we offer his own unerring square. We shall meet upon the level there, but never thence depart. There's a mansion, tis already for each trusting faithful heart. There's a mansion, and a welcome, and a multitude is there, who have met upon the level, and been tried upon the square. Let us meet upon the level, then while laboring patient here. Let us meet, and let us labor, through the labor be severe. Already in the western sky, the sign bids us prepare to gather up our working tools and part upon the square. All right, next is this week's famous Freemason, Brother Burl Ives. I remember Burl Ives as the snowman in the uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer claymation specials that used to run around Christmas time. seemed to have, in recent years, been replaced by CGI. Not my favorite, but that's another rant. So, Burl Ives, rather than just read some straightforward information about Brother Ives, I thought I'd read something by Greg Knott, one of the Midnight Freemasons. This is off, in fact, the uh, Midnight Freemason website, and it was originally posted a little while ago. In any case, I'll just shut up and read it. Brother Burl Ives, a visit to his final resting place by Midnight Freemason contributor Gregory J. Knott. When you've set goals and dreams, you don't feel old. The illustrious brother, Burl Ives, 33rd degree, Magnolia Lodge, number 242, California. I was driving to my wife's family house in southern Illinois, and I had the opportunity to stop and visit the cemetery in which American folk singer Burl Ives is buried. He is one of my favorite singers of all time. 
and I had the opportunity to see him perform in 1981 when I was a scout attending the National Scout Jamboree at Fort A.P. Hill, Virginia. Brother Ives had a long association with Freemasonry. Brother Ives was involved in Freemasonry as a youth, becoming a demolay on December 5, 1927. Then after moving to California, he petitioned Magnolia, now Magnolia La Cumbria Lodge, number 242. In 1977, he joined the Scottish Rite Bodies of Santa Barbara, California, becoming a dual member in the Valley of Bellingham, Washington, in 1990. In recognition of his many services to our order, he was invested with the rank of Knight Commander Court of Honor in 1985, coronated an Inspector General Honorary in 1987 and elected Grand Cross by the Supreme Council in 1993. Appropriately, the passing of illustrious Brother Ives was marked by a memorial service held under the auspices of the Grand Lodge of F&AM of California on May 4, 1995 at the Scottish Rite Cathedral in Los Angeles. Also following graveside services by the Reverend Stephen Willis, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Newton, Illinois, the officers of the most worshipful Grand Lodge of AFNAM of the state of Illinois assembled on May 15, 1995 and Mound Cemetery to conduct a memorial service of the craft for Brother Ives as a courtesy to his home lodge, Magnolia La Cumbre, number 242 of Santa Barbara, California. The cremains of Brother Ives were placed in the grave. As I walked through the cemetery, I noticed that several other members of the Ives were also buried there, including his parents Frank Ives, 1880-1947, and Cordella Ives, 1882 to 1954. Both of them were associated with masonry, the Order of the Eastern Star. Their graves are right next to Brother Ives. So, that's the famous Freemason for the week, and if you'd like the way that's written, again, you got to check out the Midnight Freemasons blog, which is www.midnightfreemason.blogspot.com. Still working on the .com. Anyway, I need to quickly mention a few brothers out there who helped me out with a few things here and there and who are also friends. Brother Juan Sepulveda of the Winding Stairs podcast. Follow him on Twitter at WindingStairs33. Brother Rob Lewis from the Far From Centered podcast. Follow him at Rob Lewis or at Far From Centered. Check out Brother John Paul Gomez's website, uh, thefraternalties.com, for the best Masonic bow ties and neckties on the planet. Check out Brother Jeff Koch's business, which is one of the more important things there is on this planet, water purification. And you can click through our link or... Just check out pbjh2o.com and tell them WCY sent you. All the parts are made right here in the United States, and I don't have to tell you that that's a rarity. So check out Brother Jeff Koch's page. Also, Brother Brian, he runs Pocono Pens, and of course, all of the books out there. Todd's books, Charles Harper's book, and Rob Lewis's book, all awesome. Lastly, don't forget about the Midnight Freemasons publishing three pieces a week. Also... Check out the freemasonnetwork.org, your one-stop shop for Masonic media, networking, pictures, Masonic blogs, including the Midnight Freemasons, and of course, this show. They're both mirrored there. Anyway, that's it for this week. Follow us on Twitter at Whence Came You and find us on Facebook or any other social media outlook that you prefer. We're on all of them. I hope you guys enjoyed this little bit of a longer episode. Thanks again for helping us get to over 120,000 downloads in over 58 countries and now 100 episodes. You guys rock. Stay on the level for whence came you. I'm Robert Johnson.